votre enseignement sur la mort est très réconfortant. Il y a 18 ans environ, j'ai effectué une retraite tibétaine sur la pratique de Powa, le transfert de conscience au moment de la mort. Pendant plusieurs jours, le maître nous a parlé des enfers, des enfers chauds, des enfers froids, de tous les enfers qui pouvaient exister, et c'est de manière assez effroyable, en les détaillant avec, dans les moindres détails, avec beaucoup de précision. Il nous expliquait les causes et effets que si nous sommes à vide, par exemple, on renaîtra dans un monde où l'on vivra pendant des temps sans fin, avec une minuscule petite bouche, où l'on ne pourra pas assimiler la nourriture. Nous avons été plusieurs à avoir peur. J'aimerais savoir si ces images populaires ne sont que des images destinées à nous faire réagir afin de développer notre bodhicitta, notre esprit d'éveil, ou bien si elles ont une réalité propre. Je me demande aussi si l'effet est proportionnel à la cause, ou bien s'il peut être augmenté, démultiplié. L'enfer dont il a parlé, s'agit-il de l'enfer après la mort, ou bien de l'enfer dans l'instant présent, qui est généré par l'action négative Également, que devient la saisie de l'ego au moment de la mort Et quelle est, s'il vous plaît, la relation entre le sommeil sans rêve et la conscience du tréfonds Our friend has found Thay's teaching on death very comforting. Um, about 18 years ago, he went on a retreat in the Tibetan tradition, and that also had the theme of death. And um, the teacher spoke in a lot of detail how to transfer consciousness at the point at the moment of death, but also about what happens after death. And the teacher spoke in some detail about the different hells that exist, um, those that are cooler and hotter, and certain images that are present in those hells. Um, one of the images um, was that of a hungry ghost that uh, we may, um, in such a hell, be born as someone who has a throat too small, and yet we are very hungry, but we somehow cannot receive the food to go into our body and to nourish us. Um, and there were also some other images that he mentioned. Our friend's question is, are these images um, offered uh, to help us um, wake up <laughs> uh, as some kind of tool to help us live um, more meaningfully and appropriately in this life, uh, more beautifully in this life, or do, they do these images actually speak of a true reality? Uh, so in connection to that, um, Can we speak of hells that are present on earth in this very moment? Are these metaphors for experiences that we may have during life? Or are they only something for after our death? There are a few more questions, but I wonder if that's enough. There's a question about uh, the connection between uh, sleep without dream and then uh, store consciousness. According to, to, to the form of the question, uh, we know that the, the one who, who asked the question, he already has the answer. <laughs> The way he asked the question shows that he already has the answer. Do you agree? <laughs> But that is also a chance for us to look and to see that um, 
the teaching of the Buddha um, can help uh, many people. Not only the people who have uh, a high intellectual capacity and the people who do not have uh, enough uh, education. So the teaching of the Buddha helps everyone. So there is uh, uh, Buddhism, there is the kind of Buddhism for the vast majority. And then there is uh, deep Buddhism for only a minority. So these, uh, these teachings might contradict each other uh, as far as the form is concerned. And that is why it is said that uh, in, in Buddhism there are uh, uh, 80, uh, uh, 4,000 4, Dharma doors. Uh, many, many kinds of teaching and many kinds of practice. And there are those who are afraid of punishment. And if uh, they, are, they know how to be afraid of, uh, of uh, retribution, and they, they behave better. Behave better. Because they are afraid of uh, retribution. And that is why to talk to them about hell, all kind of hells, hot and cool, cold and, and so on, uh, uh, that may happen. Mm. This is kind of threat. If you behave like that, you will suffer like this. So in many temples we see drawing of hell and that's kind of warning. If you don't practice the five precepts, you will suffer like that. You'll be boiled in hot oil or something like that. <laughs> and if you lie and then they take your, when you go to the hell, they take uh, your tongue and they cut your tongue. <laughs> and that helps many people also. But that does not help uh, other people. That is a uh, popular Buddhism. And we know that uh, the vast majority believe in, uh, in rebirth, in uh, reincarnation, but uh, their belief uh, uh, is based on the wrong view of a self. There is a self, there is a soul uh, that is distinct from the body, and when the body uh, is gone, the soul always survive and seek to penetrate into another body and continue. That is a kind of uh, a belief on, on, on rebirth and so on. And that is uh, the teaching of rebirth, but uh, it's not truly the deep teaching of the Buddha because it is based on the wrong view of the self. So, Anything, any teaching that uh, go, goes against the insight of uh, impermanence, no self, and nirvana can be, can, cannot be described as uh, the deepest teaching. So wh whether you are thinking about cause and effect, uh, rebirth, uh, retribution, um, if uh, if your teaching and your practice uh, do not uh, reflect the inside of impermanence, no self, and nirvana, and that is not truly the teaching of the Buddha. So uh, so there are many uh, things that uh, uh, that has come from uh, the teaching of the uh, Vedas, of the Upanishads. Uh, we know that before the Buddha, there was already uh, the belief in reincarnation and uh, retribution. It's not uh, invented by the Buddha. The teaching of uh, retribution uh, and reincarnation had already existed before the coming of the Buddha. 
But uh, this teaching was based on the existence of uh, a self. The Buddha, although uh, he teaches the continuation, life after life, but his teaching uh, is based on the insight of no self, impermanence, and finally nirvana, no birth and no death. So, uh, but that kind of uh, belief, which is not uh, purely uh, Buddhist, can also help. And there are those who believe that the pure land of Amitabha Buddha is uh, not here, but in the direction of the West. And you get there only after you die. Mm. But there are those of us who, who have a better, a, a, a different uh, view. We know that the pure land, the true pure land, is in the here and the now. It does not have to be in the west or in the east. Uh, when your mind is pure, and then the land is pure also at the same time. It is a goes more. Uh, uh, in the direction of right view. But uh, the spirit of Buddhism is a tolerance. So there are those who, uh, who cannot understand um, the Buddhism. You have to allow them to understand, uh, to, to, to embrace uh, a form of Buddhism that is more diluted, diluted. Like the medicine with some uh, sugar uh, in it, and they, they happen. So we are not criticizing them because uh, they, their teaching and their belief do not uh, go uh, perfectly with uh, uh, the ultimate truth, and because we have compassion, and because, uh, because we have understanding, that is why compassion is possible. And a real, a true Buddhist is always um, tolerant, not uh, fanatical. And if you are skillful, you can lead him or her slowly so that uh, they gradually abandon their wrong view and get a better and better view all the time. And uh, that may be uh, applied to all of us. In the beginning, we have an idea about the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. After 10 years of practice, we have a better view of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And after 50 years, we have, we have a deeper understanding of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So according to that, we should learn the lesson of tolerance. We should not think that our view is the best. Because uh, we, are, uh, uh, we, are, we are making progress. And we are ready to abandon the present view in order to get a better view. And that is the practice of non-attachment to view. So in Buddhism, if you, if you have that insight, you'll be very tolerant and you accept uh, other forms of Buddhism. You don't criticize. Only you, you can help people to have a better and better view and better practice. And that is why there should not be no, there should not be conflict and war between Buddhist school and Buddhism. And that has been a reality. There are so many schools in Buddhism, but they never organize a holy war in order to fight each other. And we should be able to keep that tradition tolerant. And tolerance is you are not forced to be tolerant, but because you have a right view, that is why you, your heart is open. And you can tolerate those uh, who do not have the same kind of view as yours. But you should try with uh, loving speech and deep listening in order to help him or her to abandon her view that may, uh, may still have uh, um, fanaticism uh, or things like, like that in it.
and uh, here we learn that uh, the present moment is not something that can that can exist uh, independently from the past and from the future. You cannot cut and separate the past, present, and future. We call the three times, past, present, future, they inter are. In one of them, you see the other two. And that is why if you touch the present moment deeply, you touch the past and you touch the future. And that is why uh, the past is still available. <laughs> And the future is only available. And that is uh, the insight you get when you meditate on the nature of interbeing of uh, time. 